That case in Sorit said, I'm going to sue for failure to warn the consumer how to use the product. And if you ever open up an owner's manual to a new car these days, every other page is going to be a big warning. Warning or a disclaimer. Right. Uh, you brought up another issue that, I guess, triggers something near and dear to my heart, the advertising marketing side. I understand that there is a point at which there is a marketing uh, defect, so to speak. And I think that that has something to do with how it, the instructions are provided. I have to say, I, with the number of consumer goods that are purchased by and manufactured overseas, those that are have technical manuals that always have something missing, not clear. I would think just about everyone could sue everyone for just about everything because most of them aren't explained well and are likely to cause a problem just because they're not clear. I've How do you address that? I've actually noticed that um, manufacturers have become much more careful about developing the manuals that go with the product. Um, I would never try again to put together an outdoor grill because it's almost <laughs> impossible. But the last one I did had every warning on every, there was more warnings on it than there were instructions on how to put it together. So they do try to trying. cover themselves legally. What does someone do? How does someone know that they should come to a lawyer about a product defect? And sometimes the owner just didn't do something properly. Well, for most cases, there's going to be a serious injury. And if you've been seriously injured um, by a product that you suspect was defective in some way or another, that's when you should hire a lawyer. And the earlier in the process, the better. I was involved in a case that actually went to trial. Uh, what happened was a young lady went into what was then Allmax supermarkets. Ah, yes. And picked up a bottle of uh, an apple drink. And when she lifted it up off the shelf and tilted it to put it into her carriage, the bottle disintegrated in her hand. And pieces of glass came down and sliced her leg and actually severed a nerve in the leg. And the manager of the store actually came over to the scene where it happened, cordoned off everything, and ordered um, someone to pick up the pieces of glass and put them in a box. She had put the top of the bottle back on the shelf, so he didn't know that. And he actually described it as a, a war scene. There was more blood and um, horror on that corridor than he'd ever seen in that aisle of the supermarket. She contacted the law firm soon thereafter, and we hired an expert immediately who went to Olmex, went into the manager's office where they stored the broken glass, and he put it back together. And what he discovered was, up to the point where the neck of the bottle was, which was missing because they didn't know it was on the shelf when they cleaned up and saved everything, the glass was getting thinner. And what happened in the manufacturing process, the mold was too hot, so the glass went over it too quickly and became thin mm -hmm. at that spot in the neck. So when she lifted it and tilted it, was the first time the bottle had been loaded with the juice and tilted at that angle, it just let go. And that was the defect. And what had happened was the glass manufacturer, who we sued, um, was liable for the defective bottle. They then put it in boxes and shipped it to the apple juice company, who filled it up out of the boxes that it was going to get shipped to Allmax in. So it came by machine out of the box, the juice filled it up, went back in the box, capped, sent to Allmax. Then the stocking person pulled it out and put it in the shelf. So he lifted it, or she, straight up and into the shelf. It wasn't until the load that she put on it by tilting it to put it in the carriage caused it to break. And Allmax, the apple juice manufacturer, and the bottle manufacturer were all sued and brought into the case. And before I went to trial, I thought about letting out two of the defendants because I knew it was the manufacturing process that caused the defect. But I thought about it and I said, well, we're all here, let's see where it goes. And it's a good thing I hadn't because one of the objections that the defense brought up was how did we know that the bottle that our expert put together was the same bottle that caused the injury? It's called a chain of custody issue. How do we know that it was not a different bottle that he put together that he examined? So that was not something I had expected before trial. So when I looked around at the trial, I saw the risk manager for Almax. So I called her to the stand. And I asked her when she first became aware of the injury. She said immediately upon it happening, she instructed the store manager to gather the box, and the glass and put it in a box and save it. And that it hadn't been looked at until 
my expert went in to put it back together and it had been under lock and key all that time. I asked her, were there any other broken glasses being stored on all Max property at the time? She said, of course not, we don't save broken glass. So we were able to establish the chain of custody. Um, the long and short of it is, a, a good attorney will bring in all the parties who could be liable, because until you sort through it, you don't know who's gonna have the ultimate liability. And for as much as you can think ahead, that was one that you clearly couldn't anticipate, but glad that you had e the basis covered there. Exactly. So in that example, that's not something that uh, says the consumer caused the problem by picking up the neck of the bottle. But how about that case that so many people are familiar with, with McDonald's and the very hot coffee? Um, is that a problem of McDonald's, the coffee cup, or the person who was just a little bit... Um, Callous. Callous? Yeah. It, it's a good question because that is a product's liability case. And it's really how that case is spun. You know, if the tort deformers, as I call them, the people who want to change tort law and get rid of liability for manufacturers and for um, people who are negligent, had their way, they'd spin that case as a woman who bought hot coffee, spilled it, carelessly and burned herself yes. and shouldn't get any money. Yes, sounds reasonable. But if the evidence that was presented to the jury was it was a greedy corporation who knew they could sell more coffee and make more money by exceeding the industry standard in temperature and making it much hotter than anyone else would ever sell coffee at because it wasn't safe to sell coffee at that temperature and it was their greed that caused the injury. It has a whole different look at it. That is a different spin. Right. Now, unlike uh, divorces, we talked about having no fault. Um, I understand that when it comes to the manufacturing situation, there's clearly fault that's assigned here and you're saying that McDonald's is well, at fault? It's a very good question because in some states, Product liability is also called strict liability. And if the manufacturer is liable, they're liable. Rhode Island actually has a case, and I think it's called um, Fisk versus McGregor, and it involved a um, football hel helmet. And the plaintiff was a young football player from a high school, and he tackled somebody, and as a result of the defective design of the helmet, it injured his neck to the point where I think he was a paraplegic or a quadriplegic or something. So they sued the manufacturer, which I believe was McGregor, on the theory of products liability. And the judge, I believe, instructed the jury that they could consider the negligence of the plaintiff in the way he tackled. I think the allegation was that he was taught to tackle with his head, which isn't proper. You're supposed to tackle with your shoulder, and there was some negligence in that. And the Supreme Court of Rhode Island said that a defense of comparative negligence can be applied to a product's liability case. So what that means is, if, for instance, that plaintiff was entitled to, and we're making these numbers up, a million dollars, and he was 10% at fault for the injury, meaning the other 90% fell on the manufacturer, the, the defendant, mm -hmm. they'd have to pay 90% of the verdict or $900,000. Interesting. Now, another thing I understand about product liability is that it varies from state to state. You were just addressing Rhode Island. Is that different if it were in Massachusetts? It, um, is very, it's very similar. If Jackie were here, she'd tell you the exact differences, but we let her take a vacation. Um, the difference is, um, uh, in that type of area are this that I know of. In Rhode Island, this would just be for general negligence cases in those defenses that we just talked about. We have what's called pure comparative negligence, which means a plaintiff could be found by a jury as much as 90%, 99% at fault, and still recover a portion of their damages. It's based on the ratio of their, their negligence to the defendant's negligence as you apply it to the damages. The example I gave, 10%, would come off the verdict. The defendant would pay 90% on that Fisk versus McGregor case as I made up the facts. Um, in Massachusetts, they have a different standard. If you're more than 50% at fault in Massachusetts as the plaintiff, you can't recover anything. Even if it's just 51%, well, you get zero. So there's a big difference.